honored to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Ching Zhu, an Annapolis doctor uh, in the lab. Uh, Dr. Zhu earned his uh, bachelor degree in fluid mechanics at Zhejiang University in China and uh, a PhD degree in bioengineering at Columbia mm -hmm. University in 1988. Uh, his PhD and the postdoc work with uh, Dr. Richard Gallup was on uh, mathematical modeling of cell locomotion and cell division. Uh, but now he has converted from a theoretician to a uh, experimentalist, uh, pioneering two-dimensional analysis of cell adhesion and filament molecules. Uh, Dr. Zhu joined Georgia Tech in 1990 as an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and went on to become associate professor in 1996 and a professor in 2001. Uh, he's currently uh, Regents Professor of Georgia Tech in, in e Erskine Love Endowed Chair in Engineering. Uh, Dr. Zhu has earned uh, many uh, numerous awards, including Wife in Fong, Young Investigate Award, and Presidential Faculty Fellow Award, and uh, Human Rheology and Microbes Curation Award. Uh, he's also an elected fellow of both uh, American Institute for uh, Medical and Biological Engineering and the Biomedical Engineering Society. Uh, now, without further ado, let's welcome uh, Dr. Cheng Zhu to talk, tell us about uh, mechanical reception of adhesion of signaling molecules on the cell surface. Thank you, Bao Yi. Uh, that was a long introduction. <laughs> I think people know a lot of this already, so. Uh, so, uh, um, Bao Yu alluded to that I've been here uh, 25 years, and in 1990, um, came to Georgia Tech, and Georgia Tech is not what it is now today. Very different. So, uh, I gave that title to uh, when, when, when Bob, you know, Cody asked me to do this uh, breakfast club. I gave that title, I didn't know what I was going to talk about. I gave a title anyway. Then yesterday when I tried to put together slides, um, I thought that I stopped, uh, well my talk was largely on the molecular bio or mechanobiology uh, at the molecular scale. So um, this is uh, maybe a more appropriate title and the reason for that is really it links to another title that, um, eh, why does it not change? Here is supposed to be cellular scale, and for some reason I did not change my slide. Uh, anyway, so uh, this is when I came to Georgia Tech. Uh, I couldn't find the original image that uh, Dr. Robert Nerum who uh, the formal director, the founding director of this petite institute, uh, published. Uh, so I got some, somebody else's uh, image from the internet. But this is uh, what I saw when I came to Georgia Tech, when I was uh, trained as a theoretician and then uh, want to become an experimentalist. And I look at, this is, I guess, very well known. It's when you have endothelial cells cultured in the static or oscillatory uh, condition, the endothelial cells are this uh, copper stone shape and you know, rounded and with no alignment. When you apply a steady state shear stress uh, flow over 24 hours, so you will see the alignment um, of the endothelial cells in the direction of flow and elongation as well. So, uh, that was in the, I think, Dr. Larry McIntyre, very familiar with that because he also contributed a great deal to this um, back um, when he was at Rice. So, um, and that's uh, molecular, oh, that's uh, mechanobiology at the cellular scale. So, um, and fast forward to today, um, I'm going to start with uh, some simple questions and then uh, progressively make it more and more specific and more and more um, maybe uh, harder to do. 
So uh, if you want to demonstrate mechanical force triggers self-signaling, the previous image uh, and many work follow that already tells us that this is correct. So the hypothesis has been validated because uh, you expose the cell with uh, wall shear stress or many different forms of mechanical stimuli, uh, you will see the response. And that response was due to signaling. Okay. But then, now I'm going to have the same thing here, mechanical force triggers cell signaling, but inserted here a phrase saying that mechanical force exerted on the cell surface receptor via engaged ligand trigger signaling. So that will be more specific, and the question will be, um, what is the cell surface receptor? Right? Now, uh, do it a little bit more um, specific again, and I'm going to say that mechanical force exerted on the cell surface receptor via engaged ligand, it regulates signal, signaling initiation in the cell. So here, um, you could have force applied to the cell surface receptor. Um, and then the uh, signal initiation may or may not be occurring at this cell surface receptor. Right? So um, if you, how do we figure out whether or not this cell surface receptor really convert the mechanical cues into a biochemical signal? We started looking at the signal initiated by this receptor, and we want to see the mechanical force, whether or not it does anything or regulate this uh, signaling initiation. Now, uh, I would present data to here, and try to, um, I think the data here uh, will support um, what we can do, uh, but down here it's a little bit fussy. So I put down here mechanical force exerted on the cell surface receptor via engaged ligand, regulate signaling initiation in the cell via mechanism. Don't know what it is yet. All right. So let me uh, start with a set of questions. So we ask, uh, what are the mechanical uh, sensing molecules on the platelet? Um, I can pick a particular cell, in this case it's platelet. And then here, what is a mechanical sensing molecule? And it looks like these two questions are quite similar. One is plural, one is singular, but no, not really. So uh, if you ask the top question here, the answer will be, well, provide a set of possible or candidate molecules, right? So on the cell surface, um, the uh, glycoprotein 1B95 complex, which we'll focus on a lot. Integrin is one mo another molecule we'll focus uh, on today's talk. Yeah, we'll work on T cell receptor, a lot of the other things. And then you can look at molecules inside the cell, cytoplasmic, uh, cytosolic molecules like vincular and actin, a lot of them. And extracellular, um, I'm going to start out by uh, talking about von Wittemann factor. And I know a lot of people like uh, in this campus, uh, I can think of um, Andres Garcia and Tom Barker was very interested in fibronectin. Right. So um, then what is a mechanical sensing molecule? Um, it's the definition of a mechanical sensing molecule. So it's not a possible molecule that may do that. Uh, really try to uh, kind of dissect different aspects. Or you know, if a molecule plays some role, you look at any of those candidate molecules, what exactly their roles are. I break it down into mechanical present, uh, presenter, mechanical transmitter, uh, mechanical receptor, uh, mechanical sensor, mechanical responsors. Now, the title of my uh, talk is really down here, but I'll touch on the other things as well. So here's definition. So a mechanical presenter is a molecule that presents information to a mechanical receptor upon change in its mechanical environment. Um, a mechanical receptor is a receptor that receives the mechanical cues via engaged ligand. A mechanical transmitter is a structural molecule that 
transmits the mechanically encoded information over a distance. A mechanical sensor is a molecule that converts the mechanical signal to chemical signal at that molecule or a um, assembly of molecules. And then a mechanical responder is a molecule that changes its uh, mechanical behavior in response to uh, intracellular signal. Um, now that I think about it, maybe I would not necessarily say intracellular signal. Well, let's think about that. All right, so um, I want to start it out saying, give you a first example, and this is the von Wurtman factor of VWF. As a candidate uh, mechano responder or a mechano um, receptor. Okay, so um, this is uh, one of the um, application area of my lab, which is uh, hemostasis and thrombosis. I'm showing here it's a uh, disrupted blood vessel. Here are the endothelial cells, and the disrupted blood vessel uh, here exposed the subendothelial matrix. And then the platelet here are uh, interacting with the um, von Wurtman factor here via the surface molecule GP1B alpha, uh, or a integrin alpha 2B beta 3. There were other molecules there. But let's focus on um, the von Wurtman factor. So the, this part of the work was done by a uh, postdoc, Zhen Hai Li. Someone here? All right, Zhen Hai, thank you. So um, down here is the schematic um, domain organization of a von Wurtman factor monomer. Um, in, in the blood plasma and, and also immobilized on the subendothelial surface, uh, von Wurtman factor actually was presented as multimers, very, very large multimers. So um, the domain that interact with the GP1B uh, alpha it's, uh, it's a domain here, um, A1. That's uh, uh, three domains together, very similar, A1, A2, A3, but A1 is the domain that interact with the GP1B alpha. Now, um, I'm going to introduce another protein called Adam Pierce 13. It's an enzyme in the plasma. Its role is to cleave the multimeric von Wurtman factor into smaller pieces because the larger the von Wurtman factor, the higher the adhesive activity. All right, so um, you don't want your um, VWF to be too big, and there are diseases that you have uh, ultra large von Wurtman factor that are not cleaved by this enzyme, and uh, disease called TDP. So this atom TS13 enzyme will cleave at the A2 domain right there. Now it's well known that. Um, the cleavage of the von Wurtman factor by atom tier 13 occurs uh, very efficiently in the bloodstream, not at all in a static condition. So this important function that regulates the adhesiveness of von Wurtman factor in your bloodstream is regulated mechanically. All right, so now we're going to uh, look at how uh, fluid shear stress affects the cleavage. Uh, of this. So um, we have two constructs and breaking down this molecule. Um, take a piece here, it's called a DSP, uh, TSP7, a fragment of this molecule, and then another fragment of that molecule called a cup. All right, so um, <coughs> if you take ultra large von Wurtman factor, you can obtain that by stimulating your endothelial cell with histamine. Um, you look at it under the um, confocal microscope. This is 10 micron bar. And it looks something like that, well, for us in the label. Now, you've applied a shear flow over it, and you immobilize this with a high density of antibody against the Wurtman factor, but low concentration of BWF, so that there were a lot of antibodies on the surface. Um, only a small number of them are captured, uh, used to capture the Wurtman factor when you apply shear flow these things get stretched out and then bind to the available 
capture antibody so that when you stop the flow, you look at it under the microscope, you can still see it stretched out. So this is what you see. Flow is going this, this way, right? So you can think that a molecule is mechanically responsive because applied force, it changes its conformation, right? So we use the atomic force microscope to study it its interaction with atom TS-13 or its construct. So this is the AFM that we use and um, you allow the, inter uh, the two molecule to contact. You can either, um, then you put it out, you either um, not observe any interaction or you observe interaction in which case there was a spike here showing force. Now, um, or you can do it in the other way which is you hold it at a constant force and then uh, look at how long it lasts. So that's the uh, rupture force uh, measurement in the first case, and this is the bound light time under force measurement. All right. <coughs> so, um, so if you can detect whether or not binding or not binding is a binary readout, um, you can then um, look at the frequency or the likelihood of whether or not binding occurs. So it's plotted here. You do a hundred of touches and count how many of those touches resulted in binding, and that's what its frequency here. So if you look at uh, BSA as a control, it doesn't bind to either the full end atom TS13 or its fragment TSP7 or cup. But now if you change it to VWF, it binds to um, atom TS13 well uh, and the cup domain well, but not TSP7. So you say, aha, the TS, uh, P, uh, atom TS13 binds to VWF via cup domain. That's a binding sign that you can identify. Now that's when you do the experiment um, in the absence of flow. Okay, so it's a kind of a globular image that you remember in the previous slide. Right now, it's, there was some calcium dependence because you, you can use EDTA um, to chelate divalent cani, and then the binding was suppressed. This thing doesn't do anything, so that's just the background. Now, um, look at this part here. So if you add cup domain to the solution of your AFM experiment, that would block the um, binding of the, of the binding site on the VWF. So then atom tier 13 on the surface would not be able to buy, and that's what it's reduction here, right? Also the reduction here, the cup domain uh, in the solution blocks binding. So, and, but if you use TSB7 in the solution and you put it here, that does not block, right? So that's all making sense. <coughs> um, if you measure the bound line time as a function of force, um, atom tier 13 full length molecule and the cup domain give you same kind of dissociation characteristics. <coughs> Again, saying that um, atom tier 13 by to VWF, the globular one, before you apply any forces, V the cup domain. Okay? That's what is stay here in a divalent cation dependent fashion. So now, this is. Um, Binding of atom tier 13 contract to VWF after you shear it. And you saw the image that was the stretched out condition. So BSA control, no binding, and this is um, static condition at the high coding concentration, no binding, but then if you uh, dose responsibly increasing the coding of the VWF, you see the binding frequency progressively increase until you really saturate it. You have too many. Um, um, VWF that not enough antibody to capture them when they stretch out. So then they recoil back to the uh, globular conformation in this case. Okay. Um, really, the cup domain doesn't do anything um, except that in the very, very high concentration, they are globular, then you see it biting. Okay. Now, if you then um, measure the bound lifetime under force. And you will find the atom tier 13 curve and the TSB7 curve um, behave very similarly. Right? So now, this data will say atom tier 13 by 2 stretched VWF via TSP7 
seven domain. All right, so let's see what we can conclude in this example. So VWF is a mechanical responder because it changes conformation in response to the fluid shear stress. Um, VWF is a mechanical presenter because it presents different binding sites to different domains of Adam Shear 13. Right. So I hope this example will not sell yet. Uh, illustrate the concept of mechanical responder and mechanical presenter. Now I'm going to move on um, to talk about a little bit um, the, what is the big deal, what's the physiological relevance. So um, this is a cartoon, got it to this website, okay. Uh, Some high got it for me. So uh, the von Bodemann factor was actually made um, largely by endothelial cells and under uh, inflammatory condition it secreted a very large size or ultra large von Bodemann factor and it's reduced in size by Adam tier 13. Um, if you don't do that, you're going to get um, TTP, thrombotic um, thrombocytopenia purpura. It's a disease that um, one, one form of it, maybe I, I think majority of them are actually uh, autoimmune disease where the patient develop autoantibody that block the activity of Adam tier 13, so we could not cleave this. And as a result, you have um, you have platelet aggregation and formation of microthrombi. So it is a physiologically important question. Now I'm going to move back to this definition here, and then I'm going to say that um, show two other things. So mechanical um, receptor and mechanical sensor. So I give the second example is um, GP1B um, alpha as a candidate mechanical receptor and mechanical sensor. Later on, I'm going, to say, I'm going to put, replace this of an integrant alpha 2 with beta 3 and say that that is another candidate for mechanical um, receptor and mechanical sensor. So go back to this um, cartoon that shows the um, thrombotic and hemostatic cascade uh, where platelet adhere to um, disrupt the endothelium. So um, the, what the work I will present is uh, done by uh, two graduate students. Um, Arnold G graduated, uh, I think, December last year. Uh, Yin Feng Chen is still in my lab. Are you here, Yin Feng? He doesn't have to, he doesn't have to listen to that. <laughs> All right, so let's go back. Um, so we mimic the, um, whoops. Um, how can I go back to where I wanted to? <laughs> All right, so we mimic the platelet translocation on the endothelial, sub endothelial matrix using a device called biomembrane force probe. So you grab a platelet with a pipette, and then you have a red cell serve as a mechanical sensor. It has a bead here, and then you do the measurement. So this is a uh, relevant factor A1 domain, and these are. Um, a GP1B alpha, and inside the platelet, we can also look at signaling. Okay, so that's the real image of a biomembrane force probe. It's a platelet here. Um, you have the molecule of interest. So here is the A1 domain of von Braman factor, and here are the GP1B um, Ni-Phi complex. Um, the 1B alpha is this long guy, and there were also integrins here that I will touch on later. Um, so um, you see this cartoon, and that's the real video of how the experiment were done. Um, you can look at things here. So this is a rupture force. You get a force when the retraction. Here is the contact, right? So um, this is a bound lifetime measure at about 20 picometers and fourth. Okay, it's the same thing that you've seen before. Now, in addition to that, um, we add another um, optical path so that you can you can see the um, um, on the fluorescence channel, um, intracellular calcium imaged by a calcium dye. So then um, you would get, this is the calcium signal here on the left ordinate, and here is the, each of these little triangle is a interaction that you see in the uh, other uh, video channel for the binding, and then how long the bound lasts, it's kind of here. So this is the cumulative lifetime. 
Okay, so a field control experiment, if you just aspirate the platelet, a platelet is very, very easy to get activated. But, um, you know, we get good at it now, or uh, Arnold and Yunfeng get very good at it, so you don't generate any calcium by just aspirate the platelet, or you can use a ligand-free beads to touch it repeatedly. Um, it doesn't really generate any calcium until you put the uh, ligand of von Ribbon factor A1 domain there, then you see lifetimes and then also calcium, right? So um, I'm going to start conclude that uh, the intraplatelet calcium is triggered by GP1B alpha uh, mechanical reception rather than non-specific mechanical transmission. Uh, because uh, aspiration pressure and impingement of the pipette, uh, of the plate, um, did not generate any calcium signal. Right? So now you've seen the images here and the data graph here. Um, this is um, interaction with a wild time uh, von Willebrand factor A1 domain. There were bleeding disorders called the von Willebrand disease with mutations in von Willebrand <coughs> factor. Uh, patients with those disease has a longer bleeding time. And if you use a mutant von Willebrand factor A1 domain that, that was um, found in patients uh, with uh, the bleeding disorder von Willebrand disease, and you see different kind of signals. And um, so here is the bound lifetime versus force, and this is the data actually from a 2008 paper that, um, um, that's my first collaboration, collaboration with Dr. McIntyre. Um, he is the one that got me into study of platelet. Um, so now, then the bound has a different force dependent lifetime characteristics because um, uh, with the increasing force, the bound dissociates faster and faster or the lifetime is shortened by force. And whereas in here, the lifetime is first long by force before it shortened by force. So we call this catch bound and this slip bound. So it's this interaction characteristics um, between a von Willebrand uh, factor, either wild time or mutant, um, that you use to exert force on the platelet, uh, GP1B alpha. Uh, you had a different way of exerting force, so there were information encoded in the way that the platelet um, sees the force. Uh, would the platelet able to interpret that information and respond accordingly? So um, here is the um, calcium signal. We take the peak value as a single number to reduce the rep representation of, of data, so each point it's a platelet that tested um, five minutes. And this axis here corresponds to the bar, and that's the bound lifetime. You saw that plot. So it was uh, 10, 25, 40, 60 picanutin forces, and uh, it's short lifetime and then prolonged by increasing force and then shorten again. All right, you see the two patterns matches pretty well. Right? Now, if you use a um, mutant, that is a von uh, Willebrand disease mutation. You see this is the slip bound pattern on the bars. Um, the calcium signal also followed the same trend. Um, you can e even use an antibody against the GP1B alpha that give you a slip bound and the signal follows that. Now, if I change the way uh, how force is applied, instead of applying a durable force, meaning that you apply the force to a level that you select and then hold it there until dissociation occur. In that case, um, the longer the lifetime or the, the longer the duration of the force, um, then you get a higher calcium signal. Now, if I just run the force until rupture without holding it, so that's the rupture force expand. What you see here is this data. Same thing calcium here. So this is the um, 
rupture force. It's actually much, much higher. You see this one? It's uh, 126-ish uh, piconewton. Um, this um, number here is how fast you ramp it. And it's well known the faster you ramp it, the higher the rupture force is. Right? So that's the basis of dynamic force spectroscopy. And this corresponds to the same molecular interaction. And you see no calcium generated if you do it that way. So the force has to be sustained. This is the information encoded in the mechanical um, uh, force pattern uh, that was uh, responded or interpreted by the plated and responded with a calcium si signal pattern that matches the bound lifetime but not the force. Okay, so um, what you saw before are uh, kind of pool data, uh, sample analysis. You measure many, many bound lifetimes. You can average them, uh, etc. You can also look at um, a single platelet, and each platelet give you a calcium value, the, the peak calcium value, and then you look at the um, repeated contact and dissociation uh, touches uh, and, and measurements of the kinetic on that particular platelet, and just look at a longest lifetime prior to the calcium onset. Right? So there were several uh, interactions occur, you don't see any calcium, but then boom, calcium come up. What happened? Why wouldn't it start in the beginning? Well, some of the early ones are short, so if you just look at the pre-calcium longest lifetime in and, and this axis and you plot the calcium level there, you see a pretty good correlation. And same here, a different level of force. Um, even um, for the wild time and for the mutant, they all kind of group in that, all right? Um, the other, another measure is how fast uh, calcium stop come up once you had this longest lifetime. So this is the pre-calcium longest lifetime. Here is the, the delay time from when you see this longest lifetime event to the time when the calcium spike comes up. So, of course, the stronger the simulation, as represented by the um, a prolonged lifetime here, the shorter you have to wait. Right? And you can actually look at whether or not um, this kind of um, determination, so there was a, um, you can set two um, thresholds, and this is below a threshold, this is above the threshold here, and this is below the threshold and above the threshold. I would say if the um, bound lifetime is above the threshold, whether or not you will see a calcium. When it's below threshold, whether or not you see a calcium. So when you have um, a lifetime that was above the threshold here, you would have calcium. So this 38 events that satisfy this criteria. Now when you do not have a long lifetime or below the threshold, which is in down, um, down in that axis here. And then you also do not, oh, here. And you also do not observe a bound lifetime. So it's again, you know, these two bars saying that this criteria work well. Now, would this criteria, if you use it, would you generate false positive or false negative? Yeah, you generate one false positive and five false negative. So the criteria is pretty good. Okay, so like, let me conclude. Um, the second conclusion here is that GP1B alpha is a mechanical uh, receptor because platelet signaling is triggered by force it receives. Uh, GP1B alpha is likely a mechanical sensor because it can interpret information encoded in the force waveform. Okay, so um, let me move to um, the next. Um, the other molecule on the platelet, which is an integrin alpha 2b beta 3. So you've seen this um, biomembrane force pro setup. Now um, we want to look at the interplay between this molecule here and that molecule there. We isolate the interaction here first. Now we want to see whether or not the um, signaling uh, induced by the mechanical reception of this molecule leads to a activation of that molecule. So it's, driven, uh, it's, it's shown in the bandit conformation indicating the integrin is in the resting state. It would not bind to ligand. 
uh, until it's get activated. So, um, and this is a simpler just experiment. You count one, zero, right? So um, we don't even measure by lifetime. So if you do a repeat of, let's say, two, 200 times and you count the positive ones and also count the negative ones on the bottom, there's too many to count. You, run the, you do the running frequency and here's BSA control, it's very low, very clean. But then if you added um, a um, ligand, uh, but then control how long the contact lasts, five seconds versus um, uh, 10 seconds, well, I need to change this to 0 0.5 and 1. You see the adhesion frequency change. So that's the basis of using this assay to measure interaction kinetics. It's done by Scott Chesler a long time ago, um, published in 1998, uh, my first student, I think. He looks old because he is now. I couldn't find a younger picture of him. <laughs> so uh, if you uh, plot the y-axis dihedron frequency, which is the average of multiple contact and you know, uh, the, the positive event, the multiple contact, versus the contact time, you see a curve like that, right? As you increase the contact time, the adhesion frequency increase and then levels out. And you can doubt, and these are the two students that did the work. Now, if you use a bimolecular interaction model, receptor plus a ligand forms a bound, and that's the probabilistic uh, version of the kinetic equation that we typically use to describe it, and then you fit it. First, uh, there are two parameters there. It's the molecule, how many molecules on the plated surface, on the bit surface, you can measure them. And then you fit it with this equation that's the curve fit, and then you generate two things. One is the affinity, the other is R3. So we can do this calculation. Now, so remember we underplayed it. So that's, um, you actually have two molecules, right? So if you use ADP to activate the plated so that the inner one become in a high affinity state, capable of buying ligand, and you present the plated with both the Wimbledon factor that binds to the GP1B um, alpha and also fibronectin that binds to the integrin alpha to beta 3. You get a curve actually look like that. So it's a bimolecular interaction. You get two receptors and two ligands and form two bonds, right? And the equation that So here you actually have bond one and bond two, right? Um, that's only when the two molecular interactions are independent. Um, they're not, right? So if you really look at um, the real data, it actually going like that. So what about these data and that data? So um, if you block the integrin uh, interaction using either RGD or use the anti-alpha uh, 2 beta 3 or integralin that would block the binding of the integrin, you get this curve. Um, if you do not block them and you use a nice resting platelet, initially in the short contact, you see the curve follows pretty much like that. But then as you get longer and longer contact time, it actually matches this. This is without activation by any agonist, right? It's a activation by the engagement of the first receptor ligand pair, and then activate the platelet that leading to the activation of the second receptor that binds with the high affinity, okay? So, um, let's see. All right. Um, this experiment wasn't a most desirable one because um, it's concurrent presentation to the platelet with multiple ligands and the platelet activate during the process, right? So um, um, the two students, uh, Yun Feng Chen and Arnold Ji, devised a, um, a what's called a switch bit experiment where we we'll separate the presentation uh, uh, to platelet multiple ligands in space and time. And this is a later version done by a new grad student in the second year. She, her first project is to get another pipette here. So now you get two BFP here, one pipette here to grab a platelet. So this bead's coated with one ligand. That bead codes another ligand. So one volume factor A1, fibronectin here. The platelet touches this bead first. And then you see it 
no calcium, and then after you get calcium, you move to the other side to touch the other one. So the presentation of the ligand to the platelet is now separated in space and time. Right? <coughs> so um, here's, um, again, the data from these two students. Um, if you had a discoid platelet that you presented to fibronectin, before you tickle it with the von Bordeban factor uh, A1 domain, they don't really buy well. Go back here, they don't really buy well. Now, if you activate the platelet with ADP, um, you, uh, then the, it binds, the, the alpha 2 beta 3 binds to the fibronectin very well. So these are the kind of when, um, negative control and positive control. Uh, if you do the switch experiment, you interact the platelet with uh, von Bloemann factor A1 domain, you observe the calcium triggering, and then you switch to touch it with the um, fibronectin uh, coated beads, you see occur something like that. And it's in between the two. So this is a um, integrin alpha 2b beta 3 in the immediate affinity state that has been identified by this speech uh, assay. Um, you can block it, so it's definitely mediated by the beta 3 integrin. Um, this is a specific antibody for beta 3 integrin. Um, so um, you can calculate the affinity this way. So this is the low affinity state, high affinity state. These two are intermediate affinity state. Okay, um, I'm not going to talk about this. Uh, it um, has to do with signaling. So um, you can also um, use confirmation reporter antibody that a lot of them are available for integrins. And there were three antibody. Um, one binds to here. It will not buy a bent integrin because the binding site was buried. Um, so this antibody report the extended conformation of the integrin. And the other antibodies report the swing out of the hybrid domain. And this hybrid domain swing out signifies the high um, uh, affinity conformation. And this is another antibody that binds to the active binding site. So if you use ADP to activate the platelet, all three antibodies will bind. They are all um, binding sites are available. If you have a discoid platelet, none of the antibody will bind. That suggests that it's in this conformation. If you use the von Bordeban factor A1 to engage the GP1B alpha, mm -hmm. uh, what you see is that only this antibody bind, suggesting that the hyperdomain has not swung out and the uh, active headpiece here is in the resting state. That piece is the resting state. So we can identify a conformation of the linguin that corresponds to the intermediate affinity that you measure. So function, structure, and related to that. Now, so uh, remember we're doing this repeat test of 200 touches and look at the running frequency. Um, the running frequency actually change over time in this case. If you have the extracellular calcium in a medium, um, in the first 50 touches, the adhesion frequency estimated from these 50 touches are about the same. Um, but then it progressively increase as you touch the plate more and more. Now, if you create extracellular calcium using EGTA, what happened is actually drop. Okay. So um, um, if you compare these are the high, intermediate, and, and the low affinity state, um, if you kill the extracellular calcium, it actually returns in five minutes to the low affinity state. Uh, if you allow extracellular calcium uh, and to enter the cell, I guess, you will see the high affinity state here. So looking at the last 50, that's what you'll get. This is the last 50, that's what you get. So the platelet is being tickled now by the fibronectin, which binds to the integrin alpha 2 beta 3, nothing else. Um, and that force exerted on the integrin leads to the activation of the integrin itself. And that activation requires extracellular calcium. We did not go measure the calcium, we will do that. Um, my, my guess is that it's a outside in signaling by the integrin when it's engaged to the fibronectin and force exerted on it, 
which then allow extracellular calcium to come in, which then activate the integrin, which then enable it to bind with high affinity. So you can look at the bar graph here. This is the discoid plate corresponding to the green. Um, the two orange ones are the intermediate affinities, they either this way or that way, looking at the first 50 touches. But then um, this one is the last 50 touches of this guy here. This one is the last 50 touches of the, this guy here. They decrease and increase. And this is the positive control using ADP at 51. So I guess um, in the integrin alpha, 2B beta 3 is a mechanical receptor because it's pulling via an engaged ligand or antibody induced outside in signaling, manifest as a calcium influx and integrin activation to a high affinity state. So uh, this is the conclusion number three. Integrin alpha 2B beta 3 uh, is a mechanical receptor. I already talked about that. And the question of whether or not integrin alpha 2B beta 3 um, is a mechanical sensor can be analyzed by the similar experiment used to study. So um, I think I'm going to stop here, not to go on to the last piece, uh, but just saying that we can think of put all of these together into a model where you already seen this before. We use this experiment to mimic the platelet rolling, and you get the platelet from a discoid resting state to a intermediate activated state to a highly activated state during which integrin would get uh, induced conformational change. Uh, and then go into the high affinity state after you receive intracellular calcium. So um, I think um, I'd rather not to go into a new thing, but give some time to questions. I want to wrap it up by saying that uh, several examples have been provided to illustrate uh, mechanical biology at the molecular scale. Uh, these examples were used to explain various roles a molecule can play in a mechanical transduction process, uh, biomechanical analysis of molecular interaction, and conformational change is key to elucidating these roles. I'd like to close by um, acknowledging the uh, collaborators. We have more than this list here. These are the ones that collaborated on the data that I presented. And I already um, show you along the way uh, the people who uh, did the, the work. So thank them, and of course, NI support. In the end, of course, uh, there were uh, a lot of people in the lab uh, in the past 25 years. This is a small sample of those, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. So the answer is yes, yes, and yes. Okay. So yes, uh, membrane graph or the, uh, the organization of the membrane affects mechanical receptor and mechanical sensing. Yes, we have worked on that. Um, and I, I didn't present the data, but uh, this is one of the uh, two big projects in the lab. One was on the viral infection of T cell, the other is a, you know, uh, T cells infiltrated in tumor. That they behave differently in the mechanical sensing um, and we have data to suggest that um, it's due to the membrane graph structure because you can perturb that to change it. Yeah, so, so this is really is a very important question, right? So, you know, it doesn't really matter how beautiful it looks. <laughs> uh, what is important is 
whether or not this is in, um, play a, a role in physiology. Uh, so uh, we, of course, in, in the process of doing it, and we haven't had all the answers. So one of the approach that we we'll do is to correlate the finding in these kind of in vitro experiment or ex vivo experiment with studies with, um, let's say, a mouse model that alter this molecule. So, so we are in the process of doing that, and I, I'm going to need your help to get animal CBT space for me. <laughs> <laughs> we just started That's this. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, this is uh, important. Man again. Yeah. Um, is there any chance that you could couple mechanical mechanoreception on the extracellular surface to an alternate signaling pathway on the intracellular surface? So, so. Uh, so you could control another signaling pathway. Yeah, I, I think I think a lot of people actually was trying to do that. I can think of uh, Tom Barker's lab. Um, so, uh, you know, mechanical force um, modulate the extracellular matrix, in, in, in his case, is fibronectin and the fibers that make up of fibronectin um, and in, fi in cystic fibrosis or, or many other diseases. Um, so um, the alter the property of the matrix and alter its response to force or the mechanical environment, then the, the cell that you know, normally would uh, see or feel those mechanical cues, um, they no longer feel that that leads to disease. And I think um, we haven't done much on the, along that line, but there are, it's an active uh, research area. Um, you know, one Gutterman factor is an example that we use uh, to illustrate that. Bob again. Yeah. So, you know, this is great for understanding disease. A flip side would be to exploit what you're learning for for example, in osteoporosis, as we age, one of the mechanisms we believe is going on is that the cells are losing their ability to sense the mm -hmm. mechanical environment. Mm -hmm. are, there, are there ways you can think of that we can exploit this understanding? So, so that would be a goal. Uh, we haven't get around doing that yet. Um, you know, the lab, you know, accumulate expertise over time, and we make progress stepwise. So, you know. Ten years ago, we're not doing live platelets. We're doing purified proteins. And now we're doing platelet. Now we are moving to the animal model. So uh, yeah, you know, Georgia Tech is an amazing place. And you know, IBD is a, is a good place for people to develop career. And I, I, I thought I had a lot to thank <laughs> this place that I can develop a, a career that started out knowing nothing about experiment to now enjoy. Um, uh, watching students doing experiments. All right. Thank you.